Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India This class is about embolism. Our learning objectives will be, first, to understand the term embolus, the definition. We will then see the different types of emboli and end by specifying the features of pulmonary thromboemboli and systemic thromboemboli. The definition of embolus. This means that there is an intravascular, undissolved, solid, liquid or gaseous mass which is carried by the bloodstream from its site of origin or entry in the circulation to a distant site from its point of origin. This solid mass or liquid mass or gaseous mass which is moving in the bloodstream is referred to as an embolus if it is singular and emboli if there are many. The process by which this embolus moves within the blood vessel and blocks the blood supply is called embolism. Usually this process is a pathological event. Sometimes however, in the medical scenario, emboli are created by the clinicians for therapeutic purposes. For example, to stop a bleeding vessel or to supply the feeding vessel of a tumor so that the tumor will undergo necrosis and then can be appropriately treated. This kind of procedure is called therapeutic embolization. We, however, will focus only on the pathological embolism. Let us now move on to the classification. There are three different ways in which we can classify emboli. The first method is determined by the state of this mass which is moving in the circulation. For example, it can be a solid material, it could be liquid, or it could be gas. Let me give you a few examples now. Solid material include pieces of thrombi that are present in the circulation. They break away and are pushed away distally in the circulation. It can be material from within atherosclerotic plaques, the atheromatous material. It can be bits of tumor, tissue fragments, foreign bodies, parasites and even bacterial clumps. Liquid emboli are usually flat globules, amniotic fluid from a pregnant uterus and bone marrow fragments from a fracture site. Gases can be air which can be injected into a vessel or go into a severed vessel and nitrogen gas as is seen in deep sea divers. Whatever the state of this mobile mass, solid, liquid or gas, it begins at one point in the circulation and is carried to a distant site from its point of origin. The second way in which we classify emboli is depending upon the final destination of these emboli. For example, if an embolus is derived from the heart or the arterial system and goes into the distal arterial system, it is called a systemic embolus. However, if an embolus is derived from the venous side of the circulation and is carried into the pulmonary arterial bed, we call it a pulmonary embolus. So, systemic arterial emboli 
arise from either the left atrium or its appendage, the left ventricle, from the surface of the mitral valve where vegetations may form in a condition called infective endocarditis, from arterial thrombi, from atherosclerotic plaques which have superimposed thrombi and from thrombi within aneurysmal dilatations of the arteries or arterioles. Pulmonary thrombi on the contrary usually are derived from the veins, especially the deep veins of the leg, the iliofemoral vein in specific. It can come from the popliteal veins, it can come from the veins in the calf muscles, it can come from the pelvic veins. Now, besides these two major categories of systemic and pulmonary emboli, there is a third category which is rather strange. It is called a paradoxical embolus. This embolus originates from the venous side of the circulation. It bypasses the pulmonary arterial bed, but goes through a patent foramen ovale or an atrial septal defect or a ventricular septal defect, enters the left side of the heart and then is carried into the systemic circulation. So, a venous embolus passing through the heart, bypassing the lung, and gaining access to the arterial circulation or the systemic circulation is known as a paradoxical embolus. The third way in which we classify emboli is whether it is infected by organisms or not. So, bland or sterile emboli usually are derived from thrombi. These are sterile, do not contain any bacteria. In contrast to this, emboli that are derived from vegetations on the heart have numerous bacteria and therefore, when pieces break off and the embolus goes to a tissue, it can set up a suppurative inflammation in addition to blocking the blood supply. This kind of an embolus which has organisms is called a septic embolism. And infective endocarditis is the classic condition in which we get septic emboli. So, we have now seen three different classifications of emboli. In the first, we classified it according to the state of the matter. In the second, we classified according to the site where the emboli finally rest. And in the third, we classified it based on whether the embolus is infected or not. What we must now remember is that most emboli are those in the solid state and most are derived from thrombi within the circulation. So, these are in other words called thromboemboli because they are derived from pre-existing thrombi. Thrombi as you know tend to become dry and friable and therefore, pieces can break away from it. Also as you see in the picture, if there is an occluding thrombus, then the distal column becomes stagnant and forms a propagated clot, clot that lies loose in the vessel. This propagated clot also is unstable and can easily break away and be carried into the circulation. So, therefore, let us remember that the majority of emboli seen in human pathology are the thromboemboli. These lodge in vessels that prevent their further passage. So, if they cause partial occlusion of the lumen of that vessel, they will result in ischemia of the tissue supplied by the vessel or if they completely block that blood vessel, it will result in infarction or necrosis of the tissue that is supplied by that vessel. In this picture, you can see an aneurysmal sac having this lamellated thrombus within it. This is the source of some of the emboli which are seen in human disease. In this next picture, you can see thrombi superimposed on atherosclerotic plaques within the iota 
and these two can break away and be carried into the systemic vessels. For example, here it can go into the splenic artery and go into smaller and smaller vessels within the splenic parenchymal bed until it gets lodged in a distal vessel, blocks the blood supply and results in infarction of the splenic tissue supplied by that blocked vessel. Let us now look at the specific features of pulmonary emboli. Pulmonary emboli as we already mentioned most often arise from thrombi especially in the veins of the lower limb. The iliofemoral vein is the commonest site from which emboli arise. The popliteal vein, the calf vein, calf muscle veins and sometimes the pelvic veins can also contribute to thromboemboli in the pulmonary circulation. Sometimes thrombi can arise within the right side of the heart and sometimes in associated atrial fibrillation fragments are dislodged and enter the pulmonary circulation. Besides thromboemboli, tumor emboli can enter the pulmonary circulation as also air emboli and fat emboli. We will now stress on pulmonary thromboembolism and deal with the other types of emboli in another session. Pulmonary thromboembolism arises in the leg veins in 95 percent of the cases and of these the majority are from the iliofemoral veins. Superficial veins of the leg, veins in the calf muscles and the pelvic veins may also contribute to a small percentage of pulmonary emboli. Intracranial venous sinus thrombosis also is a source of pulmonary emboli rarely. Most of these thromboemboli are not suspected during the life of an individual. In fact, autopsy series on elderly patients have shown that about 25 percent of them have had silent pulmonary emboli which was never detected during their life and they probably died of unrelated causes. The risk factors for developing pulmonary thromboembolism is very much the same as what is seen in venous thrombosis. It is commonly seen in post-operative patients who have been bedridden for some time, elderly patients who are also subjects for major surgeries, advancing age of the patient, in obesity, oral contraceptive use, prolonged surgeries for example like orthopedic procedures, in patients suffering from cancer and infections, patients having pre-existing venous diseases, indwelling catheters and in a small percentage of familial cases where there is a genetic predisposition to developing thrombosis and hence emboli. The size of these emboli can vary. If there is a single or multiple very small pulmonary emboli, majority remain clinically silent. Why is this so? The pulmonary vascular bed is supplied by two sources. One is the pulmonary arterial supply and two is the bronchial arterial supply. So if the pulmonary arterial supply was to get obstructed, the bronchial arterial supply will compensate and hence there are no consequences. So many, that is about 75 percent, remain clinically silent. Emboli in these vessels may just undergo resolution by the thrombolytic agents, become organized and incorporated into the wall of the vessels. The only residual evidence being certain threads of fibrous strands extending across the lumen of these vessels which are seen in some autopsies. However, a small percentage where multiple small emboli have entered smaller vessels, the patients present with transient dyspnea tachypnea, cough and chest pain. If about 60 percent of the vasculature is affected, 
then compensatory vasospasm results because of vasoactive substances released by the platelets in these thrombi and cause vasoconstriction. This results in hypotension because when the cardiac output is decreased, there will be hypotension. This causes right heart failure and is known as acute core pulmonale. In a patient who has been a subject for a pulmonary embolism, repeated episodes may follow this initial episode. When recurrent pulmonary emboli, that is multiple small emboli enter the pulmonary vasculature, progressive organization and cumulative damage can occur to the pulmonary parenchyma and these vessels resulting in pulmonary hypertension. In such patients, there is chronic right heart failure, what is referred to as chronic core pulmonale. If a larger embolus enters a larger pulmonary arterial vessel, it may cause distension of that vessel and rupture resulting in pulmonary hemorrhage. Here again, the pulmonary, pulmonary parenchyma recovers adequately because of the compensatory bronchial arterial blood supply. However, if a patient has congestive cardiac failure or is a subject of chronic lung disease, then blockage of a medium sized vessel by such an embolus may result in infarction of the pulmonary parenchyma supplied by that vessel. So, pulmonary infarction results in such cases. Now, we talked about deep venous thrombosis and the propagated clot. Imagine that large propagated clot getting dislodged, entering through the vena cava into the right side of the heart and going into the pulmonary trunk. This large clot, when it enters the pulmonary trunk, tends to get coiled up and block either the pulmonary trunk or go and lie astride its bifurcation. If it blocks the pulmonary trunk, it causes acute right heart failure, circulatory collapse, especially if more than 60 percent of the circulation is blocked. A massive embolus which goes astride the bifurcation of the pulmonary trunk is called a saddle embolus and when this occurs, invariably the patient just drops sudden death results. In this picture, you can see a beautiful saddle embolus sitting astride the bifurcation of the pulmonary trunk and you know the outcome in such cases is sudden death. Let us now move on to systemic emboli. These emboli usually arise from thrombi in the arterial side of the circulation. About 80 percent originate from intracardiac mural thrombi. Two thirds of these occur over left ventricular wall infarcts. There are superimposed thrombi on these infarcts and they break away causing the emboli in the arterial circulation. About 25 percent of these thrombi arise from left atrial dilatation and thrombi with superadded atrial fibrillation causing pieces of the thrombi to get dislodged. The remainder of thrombi are derived from aortic aneurysms, thrombi overlying atherosclerotic plaques and from vegetations which form on the surface of the cardiac valves. We have already discussed paradoxical emboli where thrombi from the venous side let go of emboli that pass through defects in either the atrial or the ventricular septum and gain access to the systemic circulation. In about 10 percent of cases, the origin of the emboli remains unknown. In this picture, you can see the cardiac thrombi. This patient had a myocardial infarction. You can see the thinned out ventricular wall and this dark material which is lamellated on the surface of that 
is an intracardiac thrombus. This is one of the sources of emboli in the systemic circulation. Similarly, in this patient, an aneurysmal dilatation has formed in the region of a myocardial infarct scar and the lumen is filled with thrombus. As in contrast to the pulmonary emboli where emboli can only reach the pulmonary bed, systemic emboli can travel to a wide variety of sites. Many of them end up in the lower limbs, some go to the brain, the remainder involve vessels in the kidneys, intestines, spleen and other organs. The outcome of systemic thromboembolism depends on the vulnerability of the tissue that is affected, depends on the uh, caliber of the occluded vessels and also depends on the collateral circulation in that tissue. They cause arterial occlusion with distal ischemia if the occlusion is partial or infarction if the occlusion is complete and thereby cutting off the oxygen supply to that tissue. In the lower limbs, most often we find that it results in dry gangrene of the limb. When it involves the brain, patients end up with strokes, neurological deficits or go into coma and die. When the renal or splenic vessels are involved, it causes infarction of the tissue there. Some remain asymptomatic here, however others may be brought to clinical attention with pain in that site. The asymptomatic ones are usually detected as ischemic scars seen on autopsy examination. If mesenteric emboli occur, then the bowel will undergo infarction and gangrene. This can be lethal and requires emergency surgical intervention and excision of the necrose segment. In this picture, you can see that there is infarction of an area of the lung parenchyma due to occlusion of one of the pulmonary arterial vessels. The infarction in the lung usually looks red this is because of the dual blood supply. So, if the pulmonary arterial vessel supply is cut off, the bronchial arterial supply continues and it suffuses the area with blood and hence that area will look red when it is infarcted. However, in the spleen, the vessels behave more like end arteries and therefore, if a vessel is blocked by an embolus, the in involved area will become pale in color and necrotic. So, in today's class, we have gone through the features of embolism. We defined it as an intravascular solid liquid or gaseous mass which moves from its point of origin to a distal site where it occludes the blood vessel. If an embolus is derived from the venous side of the circulation and ends up in the pulmonary bed. It is called a pulmonary embolism. If it arises from the heart or the arteries, then it results in a systemic thromboembolism. With this, we end this class. Thank you.